youtube.com slash Tim Westwood TV. Yo, Tim Westwood TV. Doc Brown in the building. What up, brother? Yes, what up, sir, what up? How oh, nice to see you again, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Been it's amazing to minute. be back. It's yeah. been a minute. And yeah, like I say, when it when it when I say minute, I mean decade. It's been a decade since I last touched the mic in any kind of serious fashion. So you're back into the music thing. I'm back. I, could, I just couldn't leave it alone. To be honest, I... I've, oh, I've, comedy wasn't working out? <laughs> <laughs> After the Ricky Jay's you, you movie, The Office. I mean, <laughs> Let me get know, it's movies. unreal, bro. You know, I never thought I'd be making movies. never thought I'd be working with, like, one of my comic heroes. I never thought I'd be making a living out of, out of you know, jokes and, 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 and writing content for TV, for, for movies. But it's like... You know how it is. It's like it's like a it's like an itch I had to scratch. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like th this is what gave me the energy to go off and do comedy. It was it was always hip hop, and so it's quite a mad thing considering I've just had my first movie out to go. All right, I'm going to take a pay cut and be an underground exactly. rapper again. Exactly. But it's it's personal, man. Like it's it's as simple as that. I had I had songs popping up in my head that I didn't know what to do with because I was just writing jokes or I was writing scripts or I was writing for other people. And eventually, just on some downtime, I just started writing again and, and, and recording, a, putting a few ideas down. And it was just the people around me going, bro, like, you know, you still quit. Should do For something it, with do it. Do it, yeah, man. So it's a, it's a weird position that I'm in right now, but this is such an important bridge for me to come on this show with you, with somebody who understands that it's, like, I'm funny, but this is not a joke. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For real, for real. <laughs> so you've got the single dropping, Corruptible. Mm. What's the story of that? Yeah. Um, it's basically, I mean, that, that was, it was one of a, a series of sessions I was doing with a, a producer called um, Cause, um, and he was really trying to push me to try different things um, in terms of like, just giving me strange tempos, weird sounds, and we were, we were both talking a lot in the studio about our own mishaps. We've been through a lot of the same stuff, and um, that song's really a dedication to myself to him and to everybody I know that sort of reaches a stage in life you know I'm a grown man now I've got two kids uh, and you still find yourself behaving like an idiot and, and try, still try, fucking up yes trying not to and um, it's really kind of a celebration and a, a, a sort of um, like a disrespect mm. of that at the same time it's like saying none of us are perfect especially not me you know but the way it came out it just sounded like a banger so we were like we should just Run jump with off with this. Yeah. Okay. It's out there ringing off right now. And then Stemmer. Now, what, what's Stemmer about? What does Stemmer mean? Stemmer was, is, this is the word I stumbled across. I, I'm trying to think what I was reading at the time. I think I was reading, um, I read a lot of like historical type books, especially about London. I love reading about like how this city sort of grew. And it, uh, I'm pretty sure it was that book. And um, I was reading about Roman London. And this word popped up, Stemmer. It's like a Roman word, an old Latin word that, um, it basically means a family tree. It means like genealogy. Mm. And the album, is, a lot of it conceptually is about sort of sins of the father, like, you know, trying to work out if the way you behave is something that you just do out of the blue or whether you've, you've learned that behavior from somewhere else and, and the fears about passing that on. So it's about me, I guess, and everybody like me, that's just like a man trying to do the right thing. And Stemma felt like the right thing to, to call it at that time. And also, I love the fact that people are going to have to look it up and work out yeah, what man. it means. But there's a secondary meaning to Stemmer as well. The, 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 the second definition is, is how trans, uh, one line of transcript connects to another in the same way as a family tree, how one line of transcript connects to a love, another line of transcript. And I thought, in, in terms of rap, that's, a, that's beautiful. It's just, it couldn't be more perfect. Cool, cool. It's good to have you back. Now, uh, for those who don't know, you were one of those old school d dudes 10 mm. years ago, like definitely one of those keep it real, mm -hmm. definitely real deal. Yep. Definitely, you, you were reminiscing about Mr. Thing and his record collection That's and right. stuff like yeah, that. Was. You were definitely in that groove of oh, um, yeah, no question. scratch I, perverts yeah. and like a lot of freestyle battles, mm -hmm. jump off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was a three times jump off champ until Professor Green popped his head above. Yeah, the, yeah. The, he, he was probably the most amazing battle rapper that I'd seen. But yeah, I'm definitely from that. I'm from that era, um, sort of the early 2000s when, you know, just on the cusp of, of grime becoming a thing. Mm. UK rap was kind of, it still didn't really have an outlet. Right, so it didn't have like a, a platform to, to build on. So I was in that era where people were just rapping for the hell of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think that brought like a pureness to what I did back then. Um, but I think most importantly, it was like school for me. 
you know what I'm saying? Like, because there was no reason to be great in terms of like money or a career. The reason to be great was to be the best out of everybody and just make sure that you, when you look in all these other dudes' eyes, they know. Mm. Like, don't, don't be having a conversation about who's the top five in London or even the UK without mentioning my name. That was, that was, that was all it was about back then. And getting together with guys and just having, having a laugh. So I'm from I'm from that era, and I think. So th that, but that's the battle rapper era. That was not making records, not no, doing. No, I think it, yeah, I, I I came out of that. Um, I guess the probably last battles I I did were probably around oh five or oh six, but uh, that was around the same time as well. I was putting out music mm. for the first time, and I was sort of building off of the fact that I'd become something of a personality within the culture. Mm. Really, from live events, you know, people knew me either from battling or just hosting events. I was known for hosting events, comparing, and I was also well known. It's funny looking back on it now, I was known for just killing tension, you know, stopping fights escalating or stopping bad vibes by just being witty, do you know what I mean? Or just being like, just, you know, come on guys, like we're here to have fun. Mm. I, was that, I was that dude. And um, it's funny looking back after, you know, a, a decade out of the game and doing comedy, there's so many things I learned from those, mm. those days of li live rap jams. The the, 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 sh the shit I was dealing with in those days, going into comedy, I was like, this is easy. Like, there's no one gonna punch me in the face here. There's nobody like gonna like threaten me. There's nobody trying to, try to tell me what to say on the mic. Like, I found stand up kind of weirdly easy mm. to walk into because so, rap was so intense. So, it, and then you got into stand up off the back of that. Yeah, the stand up thing was really odd. It wasn't something that I planned. I, oh seven, I, I thought, you know what? I don't know if I'm ever gonna make it in this rap thing. And I just had a just had a baby, and like I was starting to stress about money. And I thought, you know, it's time to get like a proper job. And in that process, I was writing some songs and recording them, and thinking, this, I'm going to put out a little farewell thing and just say like, thanks for the memories. I'm done, you know. Um, and during that process, I got a call from a dude who used to work at Radio One, and he'd gone into writing comedy, and he said, look, I'm doing this thing with Lenny Henry, and I just feel like there's certain bits of dialogue in here that. Are, urban or street um, that I think you could really help me out with. Essentially, like, I, it, it, he was like, you know, you're the only black friend I've got and I yeah. need some help here. <laughs> I'm right. He was writing this show for Lenny for an all black cast. I was like, cool, I'll, I don't know what I can do, but I'll come and help out. I went to the BBC and they paid me like a couple hundred quid to like go through this script. And I was literally, I don't know what I was doing. I was just reading through it like, like any of us would going, ah, it'd be funnier if he said this. Mm. And like, right, you can't really say like Bumba Clark is mm. like 6.30 on, on Radio 4. You can't mm. say that, you know, just little things like that. And um, worked on that one script. And then Lenny wanted to meet me and he was hyped. He was like, there's no black writers. At the BBC, there's no black people behind the scenes. And I was like, well, I'm not, just like, I'm, I'm like a washed up rapper. Like, I'm not really a writer. He goes, nah, you're a writer. And he convinced me. And then the producers kept me on for the whole series. And then I ended up becoming like a kind of a joke writer for, for, for the BBC. And it was out of that that I got pushed towards stand up. Because every producer I worked with was like, so you used to be a performer. You used to be like a musician, you was up on stage. Now you're writing jokes, but you don't put the two mm. together. So it came from that, it wasn't really my idea. But as soon as I did it, I started realizing, shit, nobody's seen this before. Nobody's seen someone who can actually rap, uh, approach comedy in this way. You know, it was me and then who? Like, probably Childish, do you know what I mean? Probably Donald Glover. In fact, I bumped into him um, in the West End a, a couple months ago um, with Riz Ahmed. He's like an old pal, and they were going Nando's, mm. right? <laughs> and I was like, dude, I'm such a big fan, man. I'm, uh, you know, it's your, your, your stand up, your acting, your music, you're dope. And he was like, oh, cool, what's, what's, what's your name? And Riz goes, he's the UK you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, crazy. And that's kind of how I feel about myself now, because it's like, for a lot of people watching this, they're like, oh, that's that dude from the telly, now, mm. he's, now he's trying to rap. No, no. Every time I'm on the telly, I think someone's going to find me out and realize, oh, he's actually a rapper. <laughs> Why is he on telly? Yeah. That's the way around. You should be thinking about it. So, yeah, for me, this is like a big return home. So you, you did the writing thing for the... So how long were you at the BBC writing? Um, probably for just under a year before yeah. I started to um, try stand-up. Yeah. And then the stand-up just took off almost yeah. immediately. And th that's when we did together, we did that, never mind the boombox. Yeah, which is that crazy. That was with Skepta. We were just reminiscing yeah. of that. That was like my first sort of TV job because I've been writing gags for radio 
and then um, that linked to this thing. Uh, maybe it was for Comic Relief. I can't mm. remember. Yeah, it was. So it was like a sort of urban, urbanized version of Nevermind the Buzzcocks. Me, you, Skepta, Eddie Caddy, and it was just like, wow. I thought the the pressure I felt. You know, I remember running up to you with gags, like, try to say this, try to say that, like, generally trying to produce the mm. show on my own. And I just thought, I've definitely, I've definitely moved on. Like, I'm learning something new. And I thought, you know what, I can grow old doing this as a trade. Mm. But sure enough, you know, I just, this is this, this like, uh, it's like Pacino in Godfather 3, and I just, just kept feeling like, I don't know, there was something pulling me back. <laughs> now, with, with that, um, it's definitely a crazy time. But then when you went stand up, you were, you were never part of that uh, black comedy circuit. The likes of Richard Blackwood yeah. and Cat. And I mean, I was, I was on it for a bit, mm. but I always did both. I always did both. I, was, I never wanted to be restricted to it. And that was not um, a conscious decision on my part. It was actually a lot of my fellow comedians, black comedians, who said to me, you've got something that could be mainstream, man. Like, don't, don't get bogged down in the black circuit. So I, I never did, but I never made a conscious decision not to play mm. it. I played it equally uh, at the start, black and white. Yeah, and it's that, where you get booked. Yeah, yeah, it's where you go wherever the money is yeah. in the first couple of years. And the thing that I did do very consciously was not change my shit mm. for either room, which was a, a huge experience because I think, you know, there, there is a big difference between the rooms, there is. But funny is funny. And if you're yourself, then people sort of buy into it. Yeah. The one thing I found I maybe had to change slightly was I had to be a bit bigger. I had to be a bit bolshier in the black gigs. But that was mainly because it was never fully quiet, like in the white gigs. Mm. Like most of the black gigs would have food. Do you know what I mean? They might have Drinks. a band as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely a DJ. Whereas like in, in, in the white clubs, like everything shuts down mm. when the comedy's on. That's, it's just locked down. It's just silent, you know. So I think that was the one thing I had to switch. But on the whole yeah i think i think my ship was just more mainstream than i thought it was you mm. know and and that 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 became apparent pretty early on so i immediately like went up another level yeah so doing the comedy circuit having fun and you should always like like do your hip-hop in there as well mm. you, should, you always rap mm. which always switched it because those white comedians in a white one couldn't do none of that yeah well i think before i arrived on the scene there was a lot of white sort of middle class comics, you know, finishing their set with a little, a little rap. Like, isn't it funny that I can, I, I, like, I'm rapping. That was the kind of whole thing. And then when I appeared like action yeah, rapping, stop that. suddenly that, that, didn't, that wasn't really a thing anymore. Yeah, and it yeah. hasn't been since. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm kind of proud of that. You know? Yeah. And you had some great moments with those, um, uh, those viral routines and they got millions yeah, of views. Crazy. Millions, like Slang 101 was yeah, a I winner. Mean, that, that, that just, that blows my mind, that mm. stuff. Cause I was, you know, it was just scribbling ideas down. Um, the, 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 the rap about tea, I'd written that for Russell Howard. I was just trying to come up with new stupid shit. Basically. Exactly, that and, But tea. in my head, it was just like, this is some stupid yeah. shit. But it just goes to show like, stuff like that, that just strikes a chord, I mean, People still come up to me in the street. They want to talk about it now. Yeah. And that, you know, that was on Russell Howard in 2012. So it's been like five years already. Wow. You know, it's, 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 it's bonkers. Everyone's racist. That was like the greatest that's, moment. That's probably my favorite. That yeah, one really. Right there. Everybody's racist. That one about the iPod shuffle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the reason I wrote that was I think the best stuff comes from a real place. Mm. And I've always had people around me, that are people that I love, but that are very unfocused you know they, they, they they'd rather play xbox get high than really do anything with their lives but they're also the same people who will cry about conspiracies there's a conspiracy against them mm. they're not achieving there's no jobs out there for them and i think well you, you haven't actually left your house do you know what i mean yeah but it's, it's it's racism and that like that always made me laugh and we would talk about it and we cuss each other and laugh about it so that was always the stuff that i would write about you know because i just think if it's a thing for us, like as mates, and it makes us laugh, mm. then there's a chance if it makes like seven guys at once laugh, laugh, maybe it'll make seven out of 10 strangers laugh. Do you know what I mean? That's the way I always approached it. It's yeah. the same, with, same with, with rap, man. I've always done it the same way. I always think, what's that interesting conversation I had last night with my boys, with my girl or whoever, like that was an interesting debate that we had. So I always take something from that and use that as the concept of the next song that I write, rather than just chatting about, oh, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. Do you know what I mean? 
For real, there's, man. There's, there's more. There's more to it. You get to something to take home. More depth. More. More. More chance of like repeat listening and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Now, what was it like writing jokes for other people? So you, you were writing scripts. Yeah. You were writing. Was that ever frustrating? Do you ever wish you'd kept that joke for yourself? That's a good question. I think. 99% of the time I'd say no I've never had that regret I think the one thing that bugged me about writing jokes for other people and still does is that I find it way easier because it's not about me so mm. I, I, can, I can just reel off funny shit in front of my laptop just like give me the concept let me let me hear the guy's voice I can reel off some funny shit for him and then when it's time to do my show I'm like trying to come up with a first line mm. for like hours because I'm not just thinking it needs to be funny. Also, what does it tell you about me? Is it giving too much of my personal life away? It has to give some of it away, but not all of it. You overanalyze mm. shit. It's, it's the same with rhymes, man. It's the same with rhymes. You know, as soon as you start getting too self-conscious, it's not flowing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And what about when you've got a comedy routine and you have to do that same show night after night after night? Mm. Do you ever worry that that would get online and people would just be predictable or do you ever worry about that or is that just standard practice? Um, I think you you kind of got to be smart. It's like in, in this week, you know, if I'm doing um, freestyle sessions for five different radio shows, I'm not going to do the same mm. freestyle each one because I know that they're, they're going to be, they're going to they're they're go there. out there, going to be out there, you know. So I think with stand-up is it's similar but the, the, the big difference is it takes a long time to perfect a piece of stand-up. It, it can take you a year to perfect 20 minutes, like make it absolutely brilliant. And if you've got a brilliant 20 minutes, why should you change it every night? The, 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 quest, the big question is when people start filming it or when it's mm. used for things, then you're going to have to switch it up a bit. And that is pressure sometimes, but I feel like I've got a lot of decent material and um, so I just about get away with it. And then the other side of it is anybody who thinks that a stand-up's doing something different every night just doesn't understand it. Exactly. Anything. Like it's so hard to create stand-up comedy. Like any, there's nobody doing something different every night. There'll be slightly different things I do every night because you, you're reacting yeah, to the situations. Sure. And those moments are the joyful moments. But as an audience member, I want to see, I don't want to see some dude improvising every night. I want to see your best shit. And I'm not coming tomorrow, so I don't give a shit about tomorrow. I mm. want to see you tonight being amazing. Exactly. That's the game. Exactly. And like, it's not like you've done that shit on a TV series and now you're taking it on the road. Exactly. You know, the shit you do in the club exactly. is the original. And when you Just finish that clubs. run, you can put it out as a DVD. Yeah, that's exactly when what When you finish I do. the run. And that is exactly yeah. what I yeah. do. I, 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 by the time I get to the end of it, that's when I record it. So like, I've just been playing with this material about an hour and a half worth of material for the past couple of years and then in January just gone I just recorded my favorite sort of 55 60 minutes of that yeah. for the BBC just as a one off special do you know what I mean live out there put to bed now yeah, yeah and move on now the office the movie mm. i mean obviously the biggest break of your career elevated it huge a huge moment and mm. like you know a proper like movie movie you know? yeah yeah yeah, I mean, it really was, like you say, it's a, it a game changer for me. I always dreamt, the little part of me dreamt that maybe one day I'd, I'd be involved in the movies, but, you know, you, you, just don't, you just don't think it's a reality. But Ricky changed a lot of stuff for me, man. Like, he made me believe that, that anything is possible, and he always encouraged me. He was always just like, dude, like, what you got, nobody can do. Remember that, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and I'll give you the platform, you run with it. And... The relationship's been like that from the start. We started off, you know, I was just opening for him at gigs and then, you know, we started working on an episode of Derek together. Then we started writing songs together and it was out of the one song we wrote, Equality Street, that the idea for the movie came about. But even then I thought, You're not really going to follow this through, but Ricky, you know, when he gets his... When he gets that focus and he gets a bee in his bonnet about something, he will, he will finish what he started, you know. And um, it was just an amazing process from a blank piece of paper just going around to his every day and just sitting down trying to come up with funny ideas he was plotting out the the story of, of the movie and leaving things open for improvising on on the day you know so there's so many bits in that film where we're just going off you know and then just trimming it down it's it's incredible but it was first and foremost it was just getting those two characters and their relationship solidified you know 
why are these two thrown together? And then it's just building off of the odd, cu odd, odd couple kind of chemistry from there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, crazy movie, not what you expected. No, it's emotional. You, did, like, you, you felt you were just going to watch uh, like a long ass episode of The like, Office, of, yeah. Office, like the omnibus edition of The Office. We went cinematic. But it, 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 it was something definitely somewhere else quite early as well, mm. like painful and cringe. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was it was not what you expected. Yeah, you almost, you almost side with Brent. Oh, like 100. You, you, yeah. you, you feel for him, and and there's a part of you as you watch it, you think, like, whereas in the office you think, oh, I used to know a dick like yeah, that, like exactly, a boss like that. In the movie, you're a bit like, you know what? I'm a bit like that sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm uh, like sometimes I feel like the one you know, getting dicked over. Yeah, and you're like the odd one out, or like you're the dude who's you know just sort of outside of the social circle or whatever. You know, everybody feels like that sometimes. So I think there's like more sympathy for him, but at the same time we push everything. So it's just bigger. You know, we got the road trip mm -hmm. element, you got the songs, you got live performances, you got big, you know, you know com comedic set pieces, physical stuff, as well as the lines. And uh, I think it stays true to the office, but it, it moves it on, which is what had to happen. So what was it like working with Ricky then? You just be over his house every day and? Well, dude, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, after this, I'm gonna go and meet him, man, because we're, we're going up to Cardiff to do a gig. And um, I, I, he's like, he's a combination of the most generous, you know, like he just like you bring him ideas and he will develop it. He will encourage you. He'll give you the right kind of criticism. He's a combination of that and like fear, so fiercely focused that it's sometimes scary. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like rare. Like he is in this right now. And then those times you're like, okay, I'm not gonna say shit because he's just on it. And so like when it comes to his shit, he's so so serious. But when it comes to everything else, he's like the ultimate piss taker. Like I can't get away with anything with him. Mm. Anything I wear, I know it's getting dissed. I know, like, the second I, I meet him, I know something, I've got something wrong. I don't know what it is. It'll be my trainers, my cap, something. But he'll always rip the piss out of me. So you got kind of got to be on it with that with him. Man. He's non-stop. And, now, and then now you're on tour with him, mm. arena size, what, yeah, like yeah. 15,000 plus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, at some point we'll be heading back over to, to Scandinavia. We played the, the Ericsson Globe in um, Stockholm when I first met him and that was 13 and a half thousand. I think that'd Crazy. probably be the biggest because yeah. we're going back there this year. And that is, that's comedy on a whole nother level, you know. But the mad thing for me is, you know, I'll do that and then I'll come home and do like a little gig here trying exactly. to get my rap off with yeah. like 200 people in the room. Yeah. But I don't care, man, because like, I think when people hear the project and when they see like the freestyles from today and when they see all the work that I've been doing to get back in the game, they'll see like, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be Stormzy, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not going to hit number mm. one, I'm not going to be a pop star, do you know what I mean? This is 100% personal, it, it, this is good music for good music's sake, do you know what I'm saying? And nothing you hear from me on this project is even going to be remotely whack, it's going to be possibly the best rap you've heard from this country in a long, long, long time. It's respect it, it's just Do you know what I mean? But it's just my thing, it's my thing, I'm not, I'm not yeah. going to come out and try it's, and pretend it, but, I'm... I'm yeah. 17 year old, yeah. like under the bridge, spitting grind bars. This, it's, this is me, bro. Yeah. You know, it's me. It, to me, it feels like you know you've reached the peak of your career, like with the movie, with going on tour these massive arenas, mm. and then you're just bringing it back to day one. Yeah, so it must be think, the not? realness must be like it's not like all of that failed and yeah. like what's left on the <laughs> yeah, table. Yeah. Let me go back. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to yeah, EastEnders yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, the, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. It's like yeah, it's different. Everything's there, man. It's a very, it's a very conscious, very measured decision, and it's one from the heart. You know, I, I did my first serious gig in ten years last week. Um, shout out Shady and Kingpin. They put me on at their their word on the street gig which is like a sort of kind of spoken word hip-hop night mm. so I was doing a lot of shit a cappella, but the love in the room was insane and the way people came out dudes that have been waiting for 10 years you know the same kind of dudes that on Twitter whenever I'm like oh check out my new comedy show check out this TV show check out this movie they're the same ones who on Twitter are like bruv where's your album <laughs> mm. waiting for 10 years I don't care about this comedy show. do it man <laughs> do it so it's man. for them yeah. it's for me yeah and uh, it's for everyone I'm associated yeah. with man it's just like yeah. I say it's good music for good music so and, and I mean you've been in a lot in a lot of like series a lot of TV mm. appearances mm. You, you've been out there a lot man mm. earning a living mm. what, what what have you got planned after besides the music yeah besides the, the, the well, on tour with the yeah, stand up man. once the tour is over I start shooting uh, um, a kind of a six-parter for Sky 
um, which is like a real big budget kind of action comedy type thing. It's like it's got a, a big chunk of action, a lot of drama, and and, and a lot of good comedy. And um, that's me and uh, Rosie Perez. Oh wow, <laughs> yeah, crazy it's nuts! Who in a way is a bit of a hip hop legend yes, as well, without if, a doubt. If, if you know your history, yeah. Jack Whitehall's involved in that as well. It's um, it's all about bounty hunters. I think that's as much as I can say about yeah. it at this point. But I'm very hyped about that. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'll always come back to TV and to movies, but it's like, you, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to this. There's like, with hip hop, it's like, it's a bit like football. You feel like, I don't know when this shit might end, mm -hmm. you know? Like you, you, you are an anomaly in some ways because you've had such a long and healthy career. Do you know what I mean? You're a legend up in this piece. But for a lot of us, it's like, it's a flash in the pan. It, like it comes and goes and then they feel mm -hmm. like, well, now I feel too old or I just, I can't come back to it. Or it's moved on too far. And for me, like, I have all those same insecurities. I have all those same fears. You know, my eldest daughter's just got into secondary school. Do you know what I mean? I got, I got, I got grown up dad shit to worry about. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not looking at, oh, what's a, what, wait, what are rappers doing now? Oh, what's Drake doing? What's Stormzy doing? What's Skepta doing? Like, I'm more like, there's no way I can pretend to be these mm. guys. I'm just like, you know what? Blinkers on, I'm gonna do my shit. And if people feel it, amazing. If they don't, I can still say I did it to the best of my ability, which I don't think I did first time round because I was just too young and too unfocused. And, and, and also the scene, you know for a fact what the scene was like back then, mm. it was just, the, the platforms weren't there. So this is my chance to just have a bash and, and, and really feel like satisfied with my own work. And you know, I've got high hopes for it and I, 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 I'm, I secretly feel like it's a, it's a very sort of structured, measured risk, but at the same time, I've got a career. <laughs> you know, I've got a career that yeah. I can go back to. So it's like it's 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 blood and guts right now, and we'll see what happens with it, man. But I just hope people appreciate what it is when it drops, and they know that this is not like a, a, a flipping novelty. This is this is this is the essence. This is it's like my DNA. You know, like everything else I do. The acting, the writing, you know, all of it, the comedy, all of it is informed by the energy that I developed as a child, as a youngster, through this incredible culture of hip hop, you know? The, the, the energy of it, the, that, that real sort of street intensity of it, all of that gave me the sort of, the sort of fizz and the sparkle to go into this mainstream entertainment world and, and be somebody, mm. you know? Like, I always look at it, because you know, sometimes I'm up there opposite actors who've, they've trained actors, you know, they've been to acting school, some of the best schools in the, in the, in the world, they've done RSC, Shakespeare, they've done the theater and all of that. And I'm up there alongside them. And I think, I didn't do any of that shit. Yeah, you're just hanging, man. I was bun and zoots, writing yeah. rhymes, yeah. freestyling. Yeah. But the energy's real, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm thinking about, when, I, when I'm developing characters for TV, I'm thinking about characters that I remember from, from those old days. Mm. You know, they say, oh, you gotta be this kind of character. This. I'm thinking, I know that dude in real life and I'm just gonna pretend to be him, yeah? It's not something that I've read in a book, you know? So everything that I do is drawn from the music. So now coming back to it, it's a, it's a real passion thing, you know? It's a real passion thing. Yo, keeping it hip-hop and I respect the love, baby. <laughs> I respect it, man. Doc Brown, awesome, baby. Too. Tim Westwood TV, let's go. Yo, shout out to my man Doc Brown, breaking it down. Make sure you check out his crazy freestyle at the crib session. Check the bars out just there. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel. Let's go.